Most of us hate the big cable and telephone companies that we're stuck with, but one small city in Idaho, it's breaking their monopoly. So while you might not have heard about Ammon, experts like Susan Crawford are excited about their pioneering model. Susan has advised the White House on technology policy, and she's a professor at Harvard Law School. What's terrific about the Ammon story is that it's about a very small town taking its destiny into its own hands in a very conservative area of the United States. Here in the city of Ammon, I feel like we are not just building a gigabit fiber network. We're trying to change the paradigm. If this model catches on, you'll have many more choices for internet services in your home. But you might be surprised that it could also save lives. Public safety, I think, falls right within the city's charter. It's right in the middle of our wheelhouse. What I mean by that is we are responsible to it, for it. The community looks to the city and expects us to deliver those services. We sat down and looked at that. It appeared to us that a growing national concern is the number of school shootings we're seeing. So Bruce, yeah, this guy right here. I'm the technology director for the city of Ammon in Idaho. His team entered the active shooter application into a Department of Justice challenge, and they didn't just win it. The National Institute of Justice actually recognized their app as the best in five years of challenges. That was also another pleasant surprise. Ammon's network is pioneering in many ways that we're gonna get into, but let's talk about public safety first, and in particular, that threat of school shootings. Our thought process was the current method, the way the responders respond to that is simply to bring everybody they can bring and send them in there as quickly as possible because the facts show that the longer the event runs, the more casualties there are. We thought, what if we could bring information to the situation? What if instead of going in blind, you actually knew what the shooter looked like, or how many there were, or what weapon he had, or where he was in the building? Because there are cameras and sensors in most all of these schools already there, that if we understood how to activate them in an automated way, we could actually get an image. All of this public safety stuff, it's tied together by the Municipal Fiber Network. But before we explain that, I want to introduce you to Greg Warner. Greg Warner, the director of the Bonneville County Emergency Communications Center. This system allows or has a capability of detecting shots within schools and automatically triggering cameras within the 911 center. So to be able to say that we can provide this additional layer of safety as a mother, as much as a mayor, that makes me feel really good. Now look, this isn't just spitballing. They actually tested this in a school. <laughs> So we talked to Rick Davis, their school IT guy. The active shooter demonstration that we did over at Sand Creek Middle School was a, a success, I think, by everybody's measurements that was involved. So you see this active shooter, and because of the ballistic software, as soon as that shot was fired, the cameras identified where the shooter was, and instantly, in seconds. These gunshot sensors can identify within a few feet where that shot's fired, and it sends that to the IP camera system, and that camera system says, here's the cameras that can see that area within the school, and within three seconds, it sends that live video feed to dispatch and it pops up on a screen with an audible alarm. Which are then verified by dispatchers and pushed out to mobile devices where officers are already in route and have been notified and are heading to that location. And so before law enforcement's even on the scene, they can identify the shooter, they know who it is, they know what they look like, they know exactly where they are in the building, they know exactly where everyone else is in the building because of the other cameras identifying classrooms and additional kids in the hall. And with the fiber, we can put it there pretty fast. That fiber that Rick just mentioned, that's owned by the city. Ammon recognized that building its own network would be more cost effective than leasing services. We actually went out to the private sector and said, you know, is there any interest here? And the response was the economy of scale just simply isn't there. High-speed internet access in the United States is Swiss cheese. It's more holes than cheese at this point. We've got at least 20 million Americans who can't get access to fast, high-speed internet access, and at any price. And then a bunch more, something like 70, 80 percent of Americans have at most one choice of a high-speed internet access provider that meets the FCC standard. 
And then we've got about 400 cities taking their destinies into their own hands and making sure that all of their citizens have high-speed internet access. We were left in the situation of re realizing, recognizing early on that we would be the last served and that we would have a single provider. There wouldn't be any choice for our citizens. Residents were frustrated. Anytime we got a hold of customer service, their answer was, well, it's not really guaranteed. It's whatever, up to. So really, if, you, if you've got connectivity, that's all we promised. Well, but it's not usable connectivity. Well, that's not our problem. We don't know. Oh, well, I guess it sucks to be you. You know, shouldn't live there. Bad place to live. It is what it is. Don't call us. We won't call you. We're not coming out to fix it. But thanks for calling. And after you do that enough times, you're, you're done. And local businesses were frustrated too. We had a, a 50 meg connection in our office and we would be able to download some days at 50 meg, some days it was 20, some days it was 10. It just became obvious that the only answer was to enter into municipal fiber. So we were really thinking we would do it, but of course there's this fear factor. So I'll get to the part of the story that I think is interesting. One of the first things they needed was advice. So they called a guy working for a local rural telephone company. Bruce Patterson, he picked up the phone and called Robert Peterson and they started to collaborate. Although Bruce, he still had some doubts. And I said, I, I just don't know because there is no going back. If we put this in, there's no going back. And he said, Bruce, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. You're worried about tomorrow, just worry about today. But that's not exactly the way Robert remembers it. And at that time, I just said, Bruce, are you crazy? Because this is going to be a lot of work. So the first thing that they did, they went out and started connecting key water department sites. It was an interesting conversation because we sat down with the water department and we said, what is it you need? And they said, well, <clears throat> we would like this. So basically, let's, let's just be frank about it. A 100 meg connection that they could do whatever they wanted across that connection and it needed to be up 24-7, 365. Before committing to anything, they asked the existing providers to bid to build that connection. Uh, they gave us a price. We looked at that price and said, hmm, we could build it for less than that. I thought, this is what we need to do. This is the future. This is like electricity was at the turn of the century. But certainly some of the council wrestled with the idea that maybe this isn't the appropriate place for government to intervene. And we're a very conservative community. So that certainly there was a lot of discussion around that. And what the water department decided was, we'll pay for it and give it to you. We just don't want to pay the monthly fee to operate it. So what I was tasked with was to go put the infrastructure in, resell the excess capacity to the community so that it could pay for the operation and the utilities would pay for the baseline rings and infrastructure that we're building everything on. I just mentioned that because I think that's a little different model than how a lot of others have done it. So what that means is we have no debt. There's no debt associated with the infrastructure in the ground. So the city's swimming pool, they needed a new internet connection also. They called the phone company to hook it up. They called one of the biggest phone companies in the country. But after calling, they waited and waited and waited until six weeks later. They said, well, <clears throat> we went out and looked at the closest patch panel and, and we may have adequate copper out there to the patch panel, but we need $3,000 from you to change out that line. And I got the measurement on the feet and I said, we could do that. And we could do it for less than 3,000. And not for the last time, they did it themselves at a lower cost and with fiber rather than copper. Next came other parks and buildings, uh, utilities, the fire department and the schools. Now they didn't raise taxes to do this. They just use their existing budget and they laid fiber strategically. We don't necessarily take the cheapest path because that might not make sense, but we try and identify what there might be along the way that, it, that we'll want to connect to it later and then we choose that path. And then as we do that as well, you have to understand that if I buy, as an example, uh, a bundle, a sheath with 48 fiber in it, I'm going to pay probably just under a dollar for that. If I buy a fiber with 144 fiber in it, I'm going to pay just barely over a dollar. Once we did that and realized we had this excess capacity and have been, been able to go out to the private sector and to the business community, you know, within the first three years, we were operating, well, we were breaking even. And now we would tell you we're operating in the black. So it, it was absolutely the right financial decision on top of everything else. 
the business community started getting excited, with banks and credit unions starting to get connected. And then wireless carriers wanted fiber to their towers. And all along the network, it was spurring economic growth. If you drive down Hit Road, which is the border between Ammon and the city of Idaho Falls, you will notice that the growth is on the east side of the road. That's Ammon. And why? It, it comes down to fiber. That's why. That's why, that's why those businesses are there. So we've seen that, first of all. Aside from maybe, you know, people always get upset about their dogs running free or their trash not being picked up on time. But aside from that, municipal fiber for sure in this last mile to the home is what, what's on everyone's mind. And that it's always a question of when. When is it coming? Not how you're going to pay for it or what this is going to look like. Just when can I have it? We want to have a model where they can opt in or opt out. That's the first aspect. The second aspect that's really important to us is that it's open, meaning that they can choose service providers. Ammon is creating something called local improvement districts, and that's where people in each area, they can opt into connecting. They'll pay something like $3,000 up front or maybe $20 each month for 20 years, somewhere around that ballpark. The more people opt in, the less the cost for each household. The key is you'll have the option. We won't force anyone into this. We won't lean your home like you might if it was uh, an infrastructure improvement like sidewalks or water line. We'll basically say if you want to participate, you sign up, you'll have 20 years to pay it off, and if you're not interested, that's fine. It's your choice. I didn't think the city belonged in the fiber optic business. Um, I, I'm one of those conservative people that believe government should be small. Um, having said that, um, I do know what the city is doing, and having watched what they've been doing after talking to them, working with them, and actually participating on the service, um, I'm happy with what they're doing. Is this appropriate for the public sector to enter in and potentially compete with the private sector, which of course is why we ended up with an open access network. That was really the motivation and drive is so we could go to the public and say, we're not competing, we're actually enhancing competition. That expression is used a lot, change the paradigm, but we're really changing the model. We're changing it technically, and then I believe we're looking at the economics and trying to combine those so that they're logical and they support one another. Ammon's taking control away from the big cable and telephone monopolies. They want the network to allow anyone to offer innovative services, like these companies. Well, part of it is if you do not evolve, um, you're probably not going to be around for very long. Uh, with uh, the city of Ammon, we are able to um, come in, use their fiber, where it traditionally would have cost us quite a bit to do our own infrastructure. So time to market was much quicker, and um, it gives us access to the customers that they're already doing business with. So we use fiber to uh, bring into the tower, and then we'll distribute 100 meg or, or more to some of our customers wirelessly. Bringing in competition and what Bruce is doing and allowing us to use him as a utility and all these providers hop on his network um, is, is huge. It's a great opportunity for all of us and for us to grow as well as a company and to get our name out there. We've had the opportunity to come into a market that we may not have otherwise been able to um, by using their infrastructure. But I do believe it's important to bring the private sector into it at least to the end user. If you live in Ammon and you want internet service or telephone or TV, you won't actually get it from the city. You'll be paying an independent company for those services and that company will be delivering it over the municipal network. We like the competition and we enjoy it. Matter of fact, we found that it's really good for us and it keeps us on top of the game as well so that we can continue to provide a, a superior product and that uh, no one kind of gets lackadaisical, if you will, on um, just saying, ah, uh, the infrastructure's in, 20 meg's good enough, you know, and then the whole area suffers because of that. But the way you then create competition for price and for services is to separate out the wholesale layer of your telecommunications network from the retail layer. The example that we like to use is actually the example of uh, package delivery. So if uh, package delivery were done the same way that we do communications, that would mean that UPS and FedEx would have to build their own roads to your house in order to deliver the package. And we all know that that just wouldn't happen. Ammon's not actually the first community to open its fiber to multiple competitors. 
but they have greatly simplified how a customer can switch providers. We call it a marketplace where they can actually sign up with different service providers. Ammon had an open house and invited the public to come test the system. This is a new experience. I don't know of anywhere where this has been done before, but we actually show them the available service providers. And in this instance, for the demonstration that the residents were able to see, we had three separate internet service providers. And with the click of a mouse, they could sign up with one and it would take it about five seconds. Uh, the screen would refresh and the network would reprogram and you would find yourself on a completely different internet service providers network. This, it's a key point. Ammon's model with the open access, the municipal fiber, it's really terrific. But Ammon, it's more about empowering the subscriber in, in ways that the big cable and the telephone companies, they never will. Ammon's special because, and stay with me here, it's virtualizing services on the network using software-defined networking. Virtualization is uh, taking a physical connection and breaking it up into slices. So you have your slice, I have my slice. It's like a multi-lane road where we have lines in between your car and my car. We're virtualizing the road is what we're doing. Virtualization, that's what allows the school cameras to immediately connect to the 911 dispatch center after the gunshot. The network just creates a large slice on the fly in milliseconds to get those school cameras on the 911 monitors. And that's the same technology that a home user uses when they wanna change their internet service provider immediately. Anyone can innovate. It's permissionless innovation. Is this something that's happening every place? The answer is no, in fact, I don't know of any place where they're actually doing this. Ammon, it is the first, but most communities could do this. It's one thing that's useful about the Ammon story is that it underscores that this is a nonpartisan issue. There is no reason that Republicans and Democrats should have any difference of opinion about the importance of fiber and its availability at a low price to everybody in the country. I guess what I would say is that we love that our system is called the Ammon model. We love that. And we love that potentially other cities will follow suit and do it the way we're doing it. We had people on the outside who were willing to consult with us and be open and share information that really benefited us to make good, solid decisions that we're seeing financial benefit from now today. And we had elect officials that gave the staff some freedom and listened to the advice they were given. So you have to take all of that, bring it into the mix. But if you can get that combination, what we're doing could be done anywhere just with the support from all of those elements. It's exciting. It's exciting to feel like when I say that we consider ourselves a pioneer, that's exactly why we consider ourselves a pioneer. Not because putting fiber, municipal fiber in is new, but because of the way we're doing it. That is new. If you want to learn more, check out muninetworks.org from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance or nextcenturycities.org from Next Century Cities. I'm optimistic about the power of mayors to get things done. I'm also concerned for their sakes that if they move too slowly, they will be outflanked.